post for today. We have two talks, one from Dr. Baffa and then the second from Dr. Chang. Uh, Dr. Baffa will go first. Let me make a brief introduction of Dan. Dr. Baffa is a professor of thoracic surgery and division chief of thoracic surgery, uh, newly appointed in recent months, congratulations. He received his medical degree from the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine and completed residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell Medical Center, and his fellowship at Cleveland Clinic. Dan specializes in esophageal and lung cancer, echolasia, gastroesophageal reflux disease, aedal hernia, esophageal diverticulum, and hyperhidrosis, all things you don't want to have. As a highly skilled surgeon, Dr. Bopper performs the majority of his surgeries with minimally invasive procedures. Committed to increasing the survival rate of cancer patients, Dr. Bapa has focused his clinical research on the prevention of tumor metastases and the early detection of lung cancer. And on a personal note, I've just uh, been thrilled to be working with Dan for almost a decade now here as we've taken an already great top and made it even better. So Dan, so happy to have you today. The floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. So um, I have one disclosure. I have a couple of disclaimers. Um, for the interest of time, I'm gonna present some data with without much in the way of methods. I'm happy to, to go over anything afterwards. And I'll even make a, a pretty egregious statement without any data. Um, and I also have a disclaimer. This is a very emotional topic and it's one that is fraught in quite a bit of, um, uh, uh, it makes people quite uncomfortable. And so um, I just wanna give you that as a, uh, as a heads up. Um, so surgical safety, why is this uh, even important? Why is this worth talking about? Um, so I'm gonna give you what I think is a mind-blowing perspective. Uh, so surgical deaths occur in patients who are likely to be cured because that's who we operate on. Um, had they not died, um, they would have lived a long time. Um, therefore, when, you, when a surgical patient dies, they forfeit a considerable amount of survival. So if you look at survivorship that's lost each year uh, from cancer surgery mortalities, it's a big number. Even though there's only a thousand patients that are, have died um, from surgical mortalities, um, they would have lived many years collectively. In fact, it is, it is very similar to what you would see if you took all stage four patients and stopped giving chemotherapy to three out of four. And I can go into detail about how we came up with these numbers, but it's a huge amount of survivorship that's lost. And so this is just giving uh, some perspective. So cancer surgery, the outcomes are quite variable and they uh, vary based on factors related to patients, surgeons, but they also vary uh, relating to um, variables that uh, relate to the hospital. So this is a classic study uh, Berkmeyer uh, put out almost 20 years ago, where he showed that as you increase the surgical volume at a hospital, the mortality decreases. The, uh, the numbers at the extremes are quite different. Uh, the, going from a 20% chance of dying from your surgery to 8%, and this is 30-day mortality, 90-day mortality is generally twice these numbers. So it's a huge amount of variability. So the question is, how does a patient pick the best hospital? Well, one way is to use mainstream media. And US News & World Report is probably the most common um, that uh, people talk about and that patients um, uh, engage when they're making these decisions. And there's some data that actually, it is a pretty reliable way to find a safe, um, high quality hospital. Um, uh, the, um, it does create a unique situation though. The um, hospital name is associated with the hospital's reputation for quality and safety and that becomes their brand. Top ranked hospitals have a strong brand. These top ranked hospitals have been increasingly forming affiliations with hospitals and communities. And during those affiliations, they share that brand. So here's an example. Um, here's Hellman's Pella Clinic. I made this up. It's famous, it's trusted, it's respected, and it's top ranked. It 
there's Middlebury Hospital, which is a hospital in the community. I made this up as well. Um, and they form an affiliation. And that asterisk is the affiliation can be part ownership. It can be just um, a uh, monetary-based uh, relationship. But there's a whole range of, of what affiliation means. But during that affiliation, the Middlebury adopts the brand of Hellman Pella uh, Clinic. And the question is, what does that mean? So the first uh, question is, what do, what do patients think of that? Well, we conducted a survey. This is a public survey, so it's not patients, it's the general population. We use GFK, um, which uh, allows you to conduct nationally representative surveys. Um, and uh, we had a study that looked at 1,000 patients. We had a response rate of just under 60%. And we asked, we asked people, what do you think the likelihood of dying from surgery when you consider a top-ranked hospital or a hospital in the community that is affiliated with a top-ranked hospital? And we describe this as a complex cancer operation. So of the 1,000 patients, um, just over a quarter felt that you were more likely to die at an affiliate versus the top-ranked hospital. 4% uh, felt you're actually more likely to die at the top ranked hospital, but 69% felt that it was the same, that the safety was the same at a top ranked hospital and the affiliate that shares its brand. Um, the, so once this affiliation has formed, once you add the name of the hospital to the hospital the community, 69% of people think the safety is the same. That's very different to when they don't have the brand. To hospitals that are not affiliated, 85% of people prefer to be cared for at a top ranked hospital. When you actually talk about the effectiveness of care, how often patients would be cured of cancer, half the respondents thought that the safety and the effectiveness of care is the same at top ranked hospitals and the community hospitals or hospitals in the community that share the top ranked brand. And we wanted to know, is this true? So we started with a study in Medicare patients. Um, so these are people over the age of 65. And we looked in the Medicare database. Um, and we looked at top ranked hospitals. And those were hospitals that had been ranked at least once between 2012 and 16. And um, because some hospitals come in and out of the top ranked um, uh, uh, cohort, you end up with 59 hospitals. So we started with 59 hospitals. Um, we used the American Hospital Association survey to look to see if they had an affiliation recorded, and that was 640 hospitals. But then we did an internet search and, and looked for hospitals that were actually hospitals in the community, the affiliates that were advertising um, that affiliation and their brand presence, something that, that the public and patients would see. Just for our nomenclature, we call the top-ranked hospitals parents and the uh, affiliates children. It's, it's just it makes it easier to talk about. We don't imply um, maturity or seniority or anything like that. It just helps us conceptualize, and I will use that terminology a little bit later. So we looked at co complex cancer surgery, and these were the procedures we looked at. Um, there were 17,000 patients that had surgery at top-ranked hospitals and 12,000 at affiliates. Um, other than a little bit difference in the age, most of the sociodemographics were actually pretty similar. When you looked at the case mix, meaning what types of procedures um, the affiliates were doing compared to the top-ranked hospitals, you see that most of the surgeries were colectomies at affiliates. So 63% of, of all the complex surgeries they were doing were colon-based, uh, whereas at top-ranked hospitals, that was just a, a third. And um, when you look at Whipple's, Whipple's made up a very small percentage of what was happening at affiliates, but a reasonable percentage of what happened at top-ranked hospitals. And there is a sense of regionalization within these networks. So again, the, the previous slides were looking at it from the affiliate or the top ranked hospitals uh, standpoint. But if you look at the type of surgery and say, where are all of the colectomies being done? What's the, the split for all colectomies? More than half of all colectomies are happening at affiliates, 
whereas for Whipples, only 18% of Whipples are happening in affiliates. So it does seem that the more dangerous operations in this mix are happening at the top ranked hospital as compared to the affiliates. So the, the cohorts are very different. Affiliate hospitals are smaller. So if you look at the beds, it's 200 versus 700. Um, if you look at other things that have been associated, other attributes that have been associated with quality, the affiliates, um, there's a big difference there. For, for Commission on Cancer Accreditation, the affiliates are less likely, they're far less likely to be a teaching hospital, and the annual volume is much lower. Um, if you look at the use of minimally invasive techniques and um, leapfrog standards, it's far and away favors the top ranked hospital. So we looked at 90 day mortality and we looked at, we first used an aggregate approach, which meaning we took all the patients that had surgery at the top ranked hospitals and we compared them to all the patients who had had surgery at the affiliates. And the dark blue bars are the top ranked hospital and the lighter ones are the affiliates. The different procedures are on the x-axis and a taller bar means a higher 90-day mortality and for everything the affiliate has a taller bar. When you look at it in an adjusted way, this is a, a logistic regression uh, looking at 90-day mortality and you, it's listed here for each of the procedures but when you look at all the procedures it's um, the mortality was 1.4 times higher at an affiliate hospital versus the uh, top ranked hospital. We did not include in our adjustment hospital factors because patients don't um, consider those typically when they are making decisions. They look at a top ranked hospital, they look at the brand, they're not looking at teaching status or COC accreditation or annual volume. We now looked at a family approach where we took each parent and looked at all of their children. So we took one top ranked hospital and compared it to all of their affiliates combined. Um, and we used a standardized mortality ratio, which is similar to what CMS uses to create its star rating system. Um, here, the orange are the top ranked hospitals and the blue are the affiliates um, collectively. And, um, Anything to the right, screen right, means it's less safe than anything to its left. So here you can see the orange dots seem to be to the left and the blue dots seem to be right, say, showing there's a higher adjusted uh, mortality at the affiliates. And when you look at all of them uh, combined, 83% um, of the time the blue bars um, were to the right of the orange bars. So 83% of the time, the, the affiliates were less safe than the specific top ranked hospital. So in summary, the chance of dying from uh, complex surgery at an affiliate is about 40% higher than it is at the, the top ranked hospital. And 83% of the time, so it's not just a couple of top ranked hospitals, that are the issue. And we've done sensitivity analysis looking at does it matter where in the top um, 50 you fall. We have adjusted for things like volume and hospital attributes and it does not eliminate this differential. So we wanted to look at this in a different way. We looked in the National Cancer Database because this allowed us to look at all ages and with a lot more patients and better staging information. For those of you that aren't familiar with the National Cancer Database, it's uh, it, contributing to the National Cancer Database is uh, compulsory for all COC accredited hospitals. It um, ends up capturing about 70% of the cancer care in the United States. So we looked uh, between 2012 and 16, um, we expanded the number of uh, um, uh, cancers that we were looking at and we ended up with 120,000 uh, patients. 80,000 at top ranked hospitals and 40,000 at affiliates. This is again unadjusted mortality. So the, the blue bars are the affiliates, the orange bars are the top ranked, and for every one of them, the blue bar is taller, meaning there's a higher unadjusted mortality at the um, affiliates. When you look at a 90 day mortality in an adjusted model, um, 
the um, odds ratio of 90 day mortality was actually 1.7 times higher. So you're 70 times, 70% 70 more likely to die from your cancer surgery at an affiliate hospital compared to the top ranked hospital. We wanted to look at long-term survival as well. So if you look at unadjusted stage three colon cancer, the red line is the top ranked hospital survival. The blue line is the affiliate um, survival. And so this is just for stage three colon cancer. It's significant uh, for stage one, two, and three colon cancer. Uh, we also looked at lung cancer and we really only did those two cancer types uh, because um, uh, in this uh, in this way, because the um, the numbers were low uh, the, for the other cancer types, uh, so we just looked at stage stratified colon and lung, and it was significantly higher at the um, uh, top ranked hospital uh, versus the affiliate after cancer surgery, um, and we landmarked these outside the 90 day mortality. So it wasn't just that um, you were uh, having fewer surgical deaths. Even of, if you just looked at people that survived their cancer surgery, the survival was higher. Um, we also looked at this in an adjusted way. Um, we used gamma models and time ratios. So a time ratio just means um, relative to the survival at the top ranked hospital. So this is the plot of the um, adjusted survival. So anything to the left of the yellow line means that they had less survival, that affiliates had less survival than top-ranked hospitals. So overall, um, uh, all of the procedures, um, the survival was less at the affiliates versus the top-ranked hospitals. Um, so overall, the, after surgery, the uh, patients at affiliate hospitals only lived about three quarters as long as patients that had surgery at top ranked hospitals. So um, in that, that uh, data was adjusted for volume as well, um, and it did not uh, change the, um, uh, sig the significance of the findings. So. Um, the summary of that, this research is that the public believes that brand sharing equals quality sharing, that surg surgical mortality is uh, 1.7 times higher if you have surgery at a affiliate of a top-ranked hospital compared to the actual top-ranked hospital, and that the survival is shorter at the affiliate compared to the actual top-ranked hospital. So affiliation does not in and of itself equal care equality despite the fact that, that a large proportion of the public believes it does. So is this the problem or is this the solution? So we actually believe that the network infrastructure can be leveraged to be the solution to a lot of the um, gaps in cancer care. And it really provides three key things, connectivity, accountability, and ability. So from a connectivity standpoint, if you look at the current cancer surgery market share, a lot of hospitals have a piece of the pie and they're totally disconnected. And it's very difficult to share um, best practices. Um, the, there's privacy issues. There's competition among the hospitals. Uh, there's the lack of compatibility between their systems. So as a result, it's very difficult to do um, quality improvement across these hospitals. But you gotta keep in mind that there's a connection between the top ranked hospitals and their affiliates um, that eliminates these barriers. It turns out that the, these networks around the top ranked hospitals, they have a huge piece of the pie. It's not a, it's, they, one out of three complex surgeries actually happens within these networks and every year their market share is increasing. So it's eliminating the barriers um, that prevent um, a lot of quality improvement within these top rank networks, and they, they are major players in the uh, complex cancer surgery uh, domain. Accountability. So for instance, Yale uh, has multiple sites uh, within the state, and, and we have, these are our multiple affiliates. Um, and all of the networks around top-ranked hospitals have a similar map um, of different states. Um, and they are comprised of very different hospitals. 
And the temptation is um, to identify uh, with one of the hospitals, um, that, that people uh, at each of their hospitals feel that they identify with their hospital. But the reality is the network is our identity and we have to embrace that. And the, we should have one set of expectations and, and for safety, effectiveness, timeliness, and the patient experience should be the same um, across the entire uh, network. And there are bodies that are starting to look at networks as individual entities to be accredited. So while I think there's a, there's a moral obligation to match um, outcomes and care with public expectations, there's likely gonna become some um, oversight that will look at how well and the way in which care is delivered across these networks. The last is the ability, the, the giving hospitals the ability to uh, provide um, excellent care. So excellent care is comprised of three domains. First is infrastructure, which are the resources and the support. And for this, quite simply, the scenario has to match the hospital environment. If the hospital is not equipped to care for uh, big surgery and the complications of that surgery or stem cell transplants, that's not where it should take place within the network, but there are other opportunities. So regionalization within a network I think is important. Process needs to be lead to consistent outcomes, but it also needs to be adaptable to the individual nuances. And I think the best way to think of process is to think of the user. So from the patient's perspective, and there's no better user perspective, in my opinion, than the users of Amazon. It's single access. It feels like it's one big store, although it's a whole bunch of different stores and different um, uh, structures that are participating. It feels like it's close to home, but it's almost never close to where you live. And it does allow for, for the public to make an informed choice. And I think that's important is to allow people to have a choice that, of where they want to be cared for um, and be informed uh, as to the implications. Um, a great network feels like a great team. And that includes not just surgeons, but medical oncology and radiation oncology, but also the nurses and the technicians and the therapists um, you have to you have to expand by programs. Um, it can, it's not just a a la carte um, expansion through affiliation. You really have to program build uh, throughout um, a network. And finally, clinical excellence. In my opinion, clinical excellence in staff is is comprised of three things: the knowledge, skill, and judgment. And you need to have experts. So here is an example of experts. This is the uh, division of thoracic surgery uh, at Yale. But you have to keep in mind that there are experts out of, uh, outside of New Haven, and we have to uh, recognize and partner with these experts and, and, and give them what they need to be clinically successful. And we can't just have physician experts. It's got to be experts at every, every touch point with patients. There has to be content expertise um, across the domain. Process may be our signature, but excellent people are our margin. And we have to give people what they need to be successful. So when you think of a network, we have to take great care of patients, there's no doubt. But we also have to be a great place to work. Every decision we make, we have to think about what are the, what's the implication on our patients and our ability to provide care, but we also have to think of the implications on the people who are working here. Because if it were not these two things simultaneously, it's not a sustainable model. I thank you and I'd be happy to take questions for 2.5 minutes. Uh, thanks, Dan, that certainly was uh, stimulating and uh, brings up a lot of uh, issues. Let me ask the first question as questions are coming in. So, um, and it's sort of, sort of a two-parter. One, when you operate at Bridgeport or at New London, do you, is that an affiliation or is that as if you're operating at the same center? So, the, we have the same expectations for outcomes, um, but the people that are involved in the care are, we have Vinnie Mace who is, 
spends time at both campuses, spends time at Tumor Board at this campus, and uses a lot of the shared infrastructure so that um, the intake process um, is driven through here. The, um, the Park uh, um, Avenue um, care model is the same care model as uh, it is in New Haven. So different people, but people that are tightly integrated uh, into uh, um, the New Haven infrastructure so that we believe we, de we deliver a very similar um, level of care. We just don't do the same things there. There are, there are complex cases we just don't do there. Thanks. Um, Herdick Shaw asks from the VA, is it possible that patients who ended up going to the community hospitals had fewer resources and worse socioeconomic status? And that was the reason for the difference. The, um, so when you adjust for, so the, the NCDB has um, income, you know, it's, it's by zip code, but um, the, um, the, when you look at, when you adjust for race, um, uh, adjust for income, adjust for education, these factors still exist. So um, I think that those are certainly things that uh, uh, influence uh, choice. Um, and um, we have a lot of research in a separate vein as to why patients choose the hospital that they do. And in a separate survey, looked at barriers to traveling for safer care because it's pretty well known that um, people prefer safer environments, um, but they they have barriers that cannot uh, that prevent them from coming. We found that about I think it was about seventy five percent of people that wanted to come to um, the flagship uh, in a hypothetical model had a barrier. The interesting thing is when we looked at facilitators, it was almost always a low cost facilitator, meaning it was a ride or it was a night to stay um, or uh, um, parking or, but, but it wasn't a huge thing that was keeping them from being able to, uh, um, to, to come. We are, you know, our new line of investigation is looking on the impact of Medicaid expansion on cancer care. And so, um, I think that's also ties into that. So we should have more for you on that front in the future. We have time for one more question. Um, the questioner asks, does time of affiliation over time lead to improved outcome also for the Children's Hospital? And I'll just add, you showed a slide where you compared expertise at the main center and then you showed care center physicians, but you were showing surgeons in one picture and medical oncologists in the other. So is this hold for all disciplines or is this just for surgery? A little confusing. I think it, it I think that, um, so I will say tune in on Friday to surgery grand rounds where I have an hour and I'm going to go into a lot of this. Um, but I, one trick is to answer the question you have the answer to. So I'm going to show you very quickly. We had 144 affiliations that took place during our study period. We looked the year before and after just to see does affiliation make things better. Um, the top bar, the dark one is pre-affiliation. The lighter one is after affiliation. So, um, and then these are just the affiliates. And then we also look at non-affiliates and see what happened. So if you look at the hospital beds, um, they got a little bit smaller. Um, if you look at COC accreditation, um, they, got, they picked up more of the affiliates gained accreditation. Um, but you also saw an, an effect like that in the non-affiliates. Um, when you look at the number of complex surgeries, the affiliates got busier after uh, affiliation, and that didn't happen in the non-affiliates. So the, the affiliation increased their market share. But if you look at 90-day mortality before and after affiliation, there's a big drop. So the affiliates um, got safer after affiliation. So that was really encouraging. Unfortunately, or, however, the non-affiliates also dropped during that time period. And when you look at a difference in difference model, um, they're actually really, the, the, the change over time is very similar. We could find no effect that affiliation made hospitals better. It, it seems that the top ranked hospitals choose to affiliate with better hospitals. So affiliates are better than non-affiliates but the active affiliation in these 144 hospitals did not make anything better.
Okay, well, that'll have to be the last word. Certainly, we need to come to some more of your lectures and talk about this more, but you know, certainly this is vitally important um, for patients and physicians alike to understand these data. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. The lecture. Okay, well, um, we have a, a second uh, talk today, and um, also a colleague and friend, Veronica Chang, uh, professor of neurosurgery, who's gonna talk to us about challenges in brain cancer metastases management. I have a little blurb uh, here also from Renee uh, for, um, uh, for her, if I can get it up here. Um, Dr. Chang is professor of neurosurgery and radiation oncology and director of stereotactic radiosurgery and the Gamma Knife Center. She received her medical degree from the U University of Western Australia and completed her residency at Yale School of Medicine, her fellowship at Johns Hopkins. Um, uh, Veronica leads the neurosurgical arm of the Brain Metastasis Program at Yale. This is a program that's uh, comprised of multidisciplinary physicians in the specialty areas of medical oncology, radiation oncology, neurosurgery, radiology, pathology, and neuro-oncology. This is a nationally uh, ranked unique program specifically dedicated to coordinated clinical management of patients with brain metastases, as well as the performance of brain sci of science, basic science, translational, and clinical trials. She's an active member of our lung spore. So Veronica, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, we started a few minutes late, so I won't cut you short at the end. We'll make sure we have time for questions as well. Um, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks, Roy. Um, sorry, hang on a sec. Okay, does that look all right? Okay, so uh, thank you, Roy, for that introduction. Um, that, was, uh, uh, that was very kind. Um, so uh, I'm gonna my talk's gonna be a little bit different than Dan's um, today. That's not at all gonna be uh, uncomfortable. Um, and uh, before I start, um, these are my disclosures. Um, so, uh, as you all know, um, brain metastases occur in about 20 to 40 percent of patients with metastatic cancer. Um, and so, you can see on the left, um, back when I uh, started uh, treating brain metastases, we only thought that a, a few types of uh, cancer really went to the brain. Um, but uh, this has obviously uh, changed over the years. And so, you can see on the right now that pretty much almost any cancer type uh, can go to the brain because while about 10% of brain metastases can be found in an initial diagnosis of cancer, by far the vast majority, um, so 90% develop later in the course of cancer. And as patients are living longer, um, I think the brain metastasis problem is becoming more prevalent. And so over the last two decades, then significant changes have occurred in the management of brain metastases. And while there have been an increasing number of successes in treatment, I want to concentrate today on some of the challenges that have arisen from these changes in paradigm. And so the biggest change in brain metastasis management has been uh, the move from whole brain radiation therapy with or without surgery, which was supported by the Patchell studies in the 1980s, to the incorporation of brain radio surgery, first as salvage, then for a few lesions as first line treatment, and then for radio surgery to pretty much everything and now to a combination of CNS penetrating drugs in combination with radio surgery. And I know that many of you are familiar with radio surgery, but for those of you who are not, Gamma Knife is the machine that we use here at our institution for the delivery of brain radio surgery. For the majority of our patients, Gamma Knife still requires the application of an immobilizing head frame that then allows the placement of each metastasis in the, into the middle of the radiation beams uh, which enables the delivery of a very accurately targeted high dose of radiation in a single day, a single fraction, to target lesions almost anywhere in the brain. And, uh, oh, sorry. Um, and so with all uh, radio surgery capable machines, however, we now also have mask-based capability. And so while accuracy of treatment and uh, long treatment tolerability is still best in the frame, the mask has further extent, expanded our capability to treat patients like this one. And so this is a 64-year-old lady who was just recently diagnosed with lung cancer. Some of you may remember her. Um, and this patient would previously have had whole brain radiation therapy because of the large number and size of lesions. Today, what we can do is break the radio surgery up into three to five days. 
So on the first day, the frame is applied um, and all the smaller lesions are treated. So you can see that there's quite a few uh, lesions that are less than three centimeters in diameter. Um, and all of these are treated in single fraction as they would be uh, for most of our other patients. Then a plan is made for the larger lesions and the first of three or five fractions can be administered in the frame. And then the patient comes back for two or four more treatments then performed in the mass to only the larger lesions. And so it's gotten very complicated from a planning standpoint, but this often allows us to avoid whole brain radiation therapy altogether. And it means that uh, radiation can be completed usually within a week. And so um, this may seem uh, a little crazy on our part, but parallel to our, uh, our institutional practice, the national use of radio surgery has grown exponentially as well, as you can see from these graphs from the National Cancer Database. So on the left, obviously, is what we used to be doing before. And then on the right, you can see that not only is radio surgery being used as a first line treatment, but patients living longer and often undergoing second and third treatments with radio surgery, and so its use is uh, escalated around the country. And so not only then do we increasingly see treatment plans that look like this one on the left, um, where uh, the blue uh, dots are the first treatment, the yellow dots the second treatment, and so each time uh, the patient comes, there's uh, more lesions treated. Um, but to the right, you can see an ever-increasing number of radio surgery capable machines being developed. And so on the top is the cyber knife, which was the first iteration outside the gamma knife. The middle uh, picture is a linac based radio surgery machine, so they look very much like our standard uh, radiation machines. And then on the bottom is the ZAP, uh, which is the newest self-shielded machine that you might start seeing coming on the market. And so the question arises then, as radio surgery becomes increasingly uh, available, um, how many lesions is too many to treat with radio surgery? And so based on survival literature, uh, which we're uh, realizing now is not great uh, for us, um, large popul population data suggests that there is no upper limit to when to consider radio surgery. Uh, since there are groups that, uh, that show that median overall uh, survival durations can be in the order of 18 to 20 months uh, in patients with greater than 30 metastases treated at one sitting. From the neur neurocognition outcome uh, standpoint, which is where we'd like to be uh, with our data, there is no guidance here since the largest randomized study involved only patients with one to three brain metastases. And this study only showed that whole brain radiation therapy was bad for cognition. And so the only data that we have to go on is this uh, small study that was done, which tried to correlate the number of lesions with how much dose the whole brain might achieve, uh, receive in a single day of treatment. And so we believe that four gray whole brain dose, uh, which is marked on the left axis, um, correlates probably to about 25 lesions, um, which is the uh, uh, current, our current upper limit uh, of safety. Unfortunately, there's very little other data to guide us. And so it's important not only to remember that number of lesions treated uh, needs to be taken in context of patient expected survival and cognitive reserve, but also patient ability to tolerate the, the treatment. And so treating 25 lesions translates into three hours of physics planning while the patient sits and waits with the head frame on, and then an additional three more hours of having one's head locked in the machine for treatment making it a seven to eight hour minimum treatment day. And obviously the time it's spent is worth it if the results are good, um, but uh, you know, it's not for everybody. So for many patients who still live less than a year after diagnosis of brain metastases though, radio surgery still remains uh, the first line treatment. And so on the bottom, uh, you can see here a volume change over time graph uh, that we published quite a while ago now, showing that if you live only nine months, there is that initial uh, shrinkage of the radio surgery treated lesion, as you can see all the way to the left of the graph, and then the volume remains stable over the course of your lifetime. If, however, you live longer than that, then there's an increasing chance that you could run into this phenomenon that you see around the 12 to 18 month mark where the lesions start to grow. And so as radio surgery has become more popular uh, nationally, uh, the rate of this phenomenon has significantly increased. And so this is a phenomenon that is unique to radio surgery, 
um, does not occur after whole brain radiation alone um, and, uh, and is becoming increasingly problematic. And so when we first encountered this phenomenon, it was assumed that regrowth was due to tumor because that's what it was when things regrew after whole brain radiation therapy. But in fact, we know now that 50% of radiographic regrowth can be due to post high dose radiation inflammatory phenomenon known as radiation necrosis, which you can see on the right. And so these images show uh, perivascular and uh, intraparenchymal uh, T cell infiltration um, associated with the standard necrosis and uh, astrocytosis and vascular hyalinization that you see following radiation. While we do not really understand the pathophysiology still behind the development of radiation necrosis, clinically we have relied on experience that suggests that if disease is progressing in the body, then regrowth in the brain is likely to be tumor. On the other hand, what we've learned is that patients who are uh, doing well in the body and have been successfully treated with immunotherapy uh, or have received repeat radiation for presumed tumor regrowing in the brain are more likely to develop radiation necrosis. Unfortunately, uh, even with these clinical predictors, we're not always right. Um, and so we turned to imaging to try to help us. And over the years, many imaging sequences have been proposed, including those listed here. The latest favorite is uh, MR perfusion. And so to the right is an example of how wrong we can still be with these images though. So this is a patient who had uh, this right temporal and then right cerebellar lesion treated nine months ago. The uh, lesion started to regrow and on MR perfusion, blue areas are considered low blood flow, whereas green to red areas are considered higher blood flow. And so where there's less blood flow, we think it's less likely to be tumor and more blood flow, more likely to be tumor. And so the right temporal lesion was read as tumor and the right cerebellar lesion was read as radiation necrosis. Both lesions ultimately needed resection for symptomatology, and in fact, the pathology was the exact opposite. And so unfortunately today, the gold standard for differentiation, differentiating tumor uh, from radiation necrosis remains surgical. One imaging modality that has been reported to be more helpful in Europe is amino acid PET. The traditional amino acid compound that has been most studied and used is radiolabeled methionine, which unfortunately, uh, has a very short half-life and has therefore been too expensive to make and use here in the United States. A much more stable compound, however, has recently come on the market called flucyclovine. And so I just wanted to introduce you to a new imaging trial that we're, we're starting here. So Pursue is a phase 2b trial which is currently open for any brain metastasis patient with lesions regrowing after radiosurgery. Its purpose is to gather preliminary data to help define the imaging cutoff values for flucyclovine PET by correlating preoperative imaging with postcraniotomy pathology. Once these imaging cutoffs have been defined though, then we'll be opening Revelate, which will be a phase three study to determine the efficacy of flucyclovine PET in differentiating tumor from radiation necrosis. For this study, both patients undergoing craniotomy and laser thermocoagulation, which we'll talk about a little bit later, will be eligible. And so hopefully, uh, you'll be seeing this study uh, coming around and we'll be able to move closer towards obtaining a non-invasive method of differentiating tumor from radiation necrosis. So the next challenge is what to do once we work out whether the lesion is regrowing tumor or radiation necrosis. What's interesting uh, over the years is that management options for radiation necrosis have become uh, more available than tumor. Um, and so these are the options available. Uh, obviously for radiation necrosis, it's possible just to observe the lesions because some of these lesions will resolve on their own. We've learned though, as I said before, that radiation necrosis tends to occur in patients, uh, tends to occur more often in patients receiving immunotherapy. And so uh, stopping immunotherapy is an option and certainly avoiding re-irradiation uh, is, uh, is probably one of the biggest uh, of, uh, ways of avoiding making this worse. There are many medical therapies that have been tried. The only one that has been uh, demonstrated to be efficacious is bevacizumab in a randomized trial. Um, but what we've also learned is that surgical management has been very effective. Um, and so back in the day, we only had craniotomy available, but if you completely remove a radiation necrosis lesion, uh, then resolution is, uh, is rapid. 
Um, not everybody wants a craniotomy though, and so uh, over the last uh, five or six years, we've developed a technique called laser thermocoagulation, um, shortened as LIT, uh, which has uh, helped us with, uh, with this population. And so again, for those who are not familiar, um, LIT is, uh, is a minimally invasive stereotactic procedure. Uh, so through the same small five millimeter stab incision in the skin, we can introduce a biopsy needle uh, through the skull into the lesion, take a bite, and then take out the needle and through the same hole, we can introduce the laser, which is uh, what you can see on the left. The patient then gets introduced into the MR machine um, and uh, we check to make sure that the, uh, the laser is, is inside the middle of the lesion. We then turn the laser on and you can see the yellow lines around uh, the lesion. Those are the lines, uh, the heat lines that allow us to, uh, to, to know when to uh, stop, uh, turn off the laser. And so this is an example of how uh, radiation necrosis works best. And so to the left, you can see um, a patient who had had, in fact, 23 lesions treated with radio surgery. Of all of them, though, this was the only lesion in the right basal ganglia that became a problem, so it started to regrow. It was associated with a lot of edema around it. We went ahead and, uh, and treated this lesion. Um, and, uh, and you can see that uh, the uh, incision is only a couple of staples uh, long. The patient was able to go home uh, first day after surgery. Uh, they were able to come off steroids in a week. And you can see in two weeks how quickly, even though the lesion size itself has not decreased, um, that the edema has gotten better. Um, and by six weeks, obviously, uh, a good resolution. And so, uh, so the nice thing is we haven't had to do craniotomies for these lesions, which are obviously uh, significantly morbid, and have been able to offer one additional uh, option. Um, and so uh, how we decide which option uh, to treat with, uh, with for radiation necrosis still remains highly variable. So we went back and looked at our in institutional experience to try and work out if we could start to standardize how we choose uh, what we do. So the first study we did uh, looked at craniotomy versus lit. Um, and uh, what we learned was that both tools are pretty good at taking care of, uh, of radiation necrosis. What it appears though is that symptom uh, resolution and ability to wean off steroids may be better with craniotomy, um, but what we realized also was that uh, the lesion volume was larger in our craniotomy patients. And so when we took out all the lesions that were greater than three centimeters in diameter, uh, what you can see all the way to the left is that, uh, is that in fact uh, the two surgical tools, lit and craniotomy, uh, basically become uh, uh, comparable um, in efficacy um, and really what becomes uh, uh, the decider for how well things work is whether or not the lesion is radiation necrosis or tumor. And so from this we started uh, uh, first of all to um, uh, try and detect lesions when they're small uh, so that we can uh, take advantage of the minimally invasive uh, uh, technique of LIT rather than having to condemn the patient to craniotomy. Um, but uh, obviously, if the lesion is larger than three centimeters, um, then craniotomy is still effective. Um, the, uh, what we did next was then try and compare uh, use of lit to um, Avastin. And what you can see here is that uh, we actually have um, two very different populations uh, being uh, chosen for the two different uh, treatments. Um, so uh, lit patients tending to be a little bit better uh, functionally, um, and not only that, but the time from radio surgery to lit uh, tends to be significantly longer than uh, for those getting uh, bevacizumab. And so for whatever reason, patients who, uh, who have lesions that are regrowing early after radio surgery are, are, uh, tend to be getting a uh, drug uh, more frequently. In addition to that, when we look at local lesional control, what we also see is two very different patterns of response, again, making the two treatments very hard to compare. If we start with the graph on the right, the graph shows a 3D volume change over time again. And you can see that uh, the black line, which is the bevacizumab line, um, there's a relatively rapid decrease in lesion size in response to Avastin, but that this response ultimately does not uh, last forever. In addition, on the left, you can see based on the RANO criteria that while a 
a subset of patients have an excellent response to Avastin showing a CR, uh, both at three and six months. The majority of patients only had disease stabilization and then progression. In comparison, after LIT, there is the expected increase in lesion volume uh, from the surgical procedure itself, but then a good long-term volumetric response. Using RANO, this is less easy to interpret because much of the volume change were large enough to result in a progression of disease reading uh, early on um, that then resolved to stable disease by six months. And so ultimately local control was significantly better at six months and beyond for laser compared to Avastin, but obviously uh, if you have a large lesion with mass effect relatively early on that can't be surgically resected, then Avastin now clearly plays a role. Lastly, from a multi-institutional study of LIT, we learned that complete ablation of a radiation necrosis lesion results in better local control than partial ablation. So you can see in the first two lines of the uh, table to the left. And so the smaller the lesion at the time of LIT, the more likely it will resolve postoperatively. And so this last point, as you can see, also applies to regrowing tumor, which is the bottom two rows of the table to the left. And for this reason, we have started advocating for LIT much earlier in the course of these uh, patients, whether we think it's radiation necrosis or tumor. Uh, to the right, um, the study also underscores one more problem in brain metastasis management, and that is that regrowing tumor, uh, both in the uh, um, local control as well as survival uh, data, is a much bigger problem to manage than radiation necrosis. And so this brings us to kind of how we uh, offer radiation dosing here. And so while we would prefer that our patients not get either complication, if we had to pick one complication, radiation necrosis would be the preferable one um, because we seem to have better treatment options available. All right, and so for the last few minutes, I wanted to move away from surgery and radiation and talk a little bit about work that we've been doing looking at recurrent tumors. So recurrent tumor, being the most difficult of, uh, of uh, the problems that we manage. Um, unfortunately, more radiation and surgery is uh, usually morbid for the patient. Um, and so is there a way that we can look at changing systemic therapy to be uh, more effective in the brain? And so I, I wanna uh, thank Dr. Herbst uh, and the SPORE group for uh, the opportunity to participate in the lung SPORE um, and credit for the work that I'm about to present goes mostly to my collaborators, Don Wynn in pathology and Avi Patel in radiation oncology and their labs uh, for, uh, for hosting us, but also to Stephanie Chiok, who's one of our star neurosurgery residents, who was really the force behind getting a lot of this work done. And so as background, uh, the two proposed mechanisms for CNS failure, um, particularly uh, we've been looking at lung cancers with targetable mutations are either that drug penetration to the CNS remains low. And so compared with uh, systemic concentrations, tolerance can develop in the central nervous system uh, over time. Or the second uh, uh, mechanism is that as shown by Priscilla Brastianos through the whole, whole exome sequencing data that she's presented before, that clinically actionable gene alterations can be present in brain metastases um, that, would, that may not be found in the primary tumor. Brain metastasis tissue, however, is often difficult to obtain, and so we propose that perhaps by looking at cell-free DNA in the CSF, we may be able to better study CNS tumor mutations. So we started a CSF uh, biorepository in 2017 and have been collecting time-matched CSF blood and brain metastasis tissue where possible. Things slowed down a little bit with COVID, um, but we have over 100 samples now, and this is a breakdown of their pathologies, and this is the gene panel that we've been using, which we recognize may be a little bit limited, um, but we had to start it somewhere. And so this is a little bit of a busy slide, but what you can see is that we've been successful at finding tumor DNA in the CSF in about two thirds of our patients with purely intrafranchimal brain metastases, so not leptomeningeal disease, although the amount of DNA has been highly variable. In addition, in the table uh, on the left to the top, you can see that while tumor DNA was also detectable in the blood of many of our patients with intraparenchymal brain metastases, neither patient with cytology proven leptomeningeal disease had tumor DNA in their plasma. 
And so when we broke down our population into patients with no stable or progressing systemic disease, you can see that plasma DNA tends actually to be more reflective of extracranial disease than intracranial disease. And lastly, to the right, when matching mutations found in CSF, plasma and brain metastasis tissue, it appears in fact that tumor DNA in the CSF matches the brain metastasis much better than plasma uh, circulating DNA. And so it seems that tumor DNA found in the CSF may be a better way to study brain metastases mutation. We need to collect obviously more samples and so we'll be coming to you all um, to try and get these samples. But we're hoping that uh, if the data is in fact validated, that we'll be able to use CSF perhaps as a way to inform changes in our systemic therapy options for recurrent brain metastases. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thanks, Veronica. That was wonderful. We do have time for questions as the questions come in. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we have our Ask a Review on October 23rd this year. We're doing it virtually from 8 to uh, 1. Um, so um, uh, tell us a little bit more about how you uh, get the CSF from the patients. Uh, these are lumbar punctures that are done on patients identified from the clinics. So yeah, so we actually have a, a variety. Um, so I can just go back here for a sec. Um, so we have a variety of points where we can, uh, we can get CSF. Um, so the biggest one has mostly been from craniotomy. Um, so we try and identify a site where we can get CSF that's distant than uh, than the lesion that we're about to resect and we get the CSF before we resect the lesion. So hopefully there's no contamination. Um, but yes, uh, the other places, um, so one is uh, um, on the wards. And so I think if there's any concern in patients for leptomeningeal disease and we're getting a diagnostic lumbar puncture, then it'd be nice to be able to get CSF at that time. And then the last mechanism uh, is one that's a little bit unique um, and has provided a little bit of a challenge also so patients uh, who are actually getting a uh, re-biopsy as part of kind of the lung protocols um, for pro at progression of disease, if they also have progression in their central nervous system, so untreated brain metastases, then we've been asking those patients uh, at the time of their bronch to have a lumbar puncture performed um, to get CSF as well. And so those are kind of the three opportunities that we have. Um, and then, uh, yes, and then obviously in the clinic, if, uh, if we're seeing patients that need lumbar punctures for clinical reasons. Right. We do have a question. Someone asks, they say, thank you for your wonderful program and all your help with brain metastases over the years. Is there a limit to the number of metastases that you can use gamma knife for? Yeah. So I think it goes back to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, what we think patients can tolerate. So gamma knife, uh, obviously there isn't a limit, um, the planning system allows us to treat, I think, over, over 100 lesions now um, within the planning system. Um, so logistically, it's, uh, it's not impossible to do that. As I had said, though, I think to treat 25 lesions is, is hard enough for a patient um, in a single day. And certainly those are 25 lesions that are easy to plan and, um, and, and, uh, and relatively easy to treat. Um, I think for those patients who have larger lesions and lesions in more complex areas, such as up against the, um, you know, the brainstem or the optic nerves or whatever, then, you know, the, the, uh, the planning and the treatment for those lesions takes even longer. Um, so we are, <laughs> the ra our radiation oncologists are trying to keep the cap at 25 um, because uh, as we had shown that uh, the whole brain dose is about four gray. Um, but in addition to that, that's, it's about as long as a patient can tolerate seven or eight hours with, uh, with us. It's not so fun with us down the basement. That's great. And the final question from someone who's obviously been watching the entire day, uh, they, they ask, um, um, are you um, uh, doing the Gamma Knife at sites outside of Cedar Street, or is it all being done at the main center? And are there plans to expand this around Connecticut? So, uh, so the Gamma Knife machine per se, uh, um, there's only one of those uh, here in Connecticut. Um, the uh, uh, certificate of need, it's difficult to get more than one uh, in, in our little state. Um, but uh, brain radio surgery, uh, which can be done either with Gamma Knife or Linac based uh, techniques, there's actually uh, 11 centers around the, around the state that are, uh, that are capable of it. With LINAC-based radiosurgery, though, the software uh, is not capable, really, of treating 
uh, more than 10 lesions at a time. And once you've exceeded 10 total, uh, whether it be all at one time or over several treatments, then it gets really difficult to take into account what's been treated before uh, as, uh, uh, versus what needs to be treated going forward. And it's the reason why the multiple metastases always end up here. Um, and so I think, um, as Dr. Buffer was saying before, uh, you know, it is the reason why uh, we, we are the referral center. Um, I'm not sure that there's enough volume necessarily to grow around the state. Um, and it's a very expensive um, and time consuming, uh, um, you know, treatment. So it's, it's hard to cultivate elsewhere. I know, I know I said last question, but I can't not ask Dr. <laughs> Sklar's question. Um, uh, you know, Jeff, thank you. He, he asks, how do you propose to use CSF DNA in patients with multiple lesions? For example, your patient who had both tumor necrosis and regrowth of tumor. So, uh, um, so it's interesting. I, I don't, I think that uh, finding, um, so we don't have a marker necessarily for radiation necrosis per se. Um, what I, what I think that uh, we care about is, is there regrowing tumor? And so I think that if we find mutational DNA, first of all, we don't 100% we don't know that it correlates with active disease yet. Um, but if we're able to demonstrate that, then we need to uh, be concerned that uh, we're not just treating radiation necrosis. And I think that's really the issue. Great. Well, I think that we are at time and actually a few minutes over, but no one needs to walk back to their office. So I figured I could get a few more minutes in there. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you to the organizers, Renee and the team. And we'll see you back next week. Um, it's been a pleasure moderating today. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.